Добрий день, мене звуть Good morning, my name is Olga Tamanova and I want to thank everybody who joins us in Ukraine Media Center Ukraine Forum today. It's year 10 of the war and day 559 of the full-scale invasion of our homeland by Russian aggressor and I traditionally want to start our broadcast with thanking the representatives of all the mass media who tell the world the truth about this world. Today we invited you, you may have probably heard about the special operation of Chief Intelligence Department called TITMOS, uh, the hijacking of Russian helicopters. So we've invited you for the presentation of this brilliant operation that will be described in the textbooks on history and intelligence. I would like to ask you not to broadcast this event online. You will be able to use the video after this event is over. I want to introduce our speakers today. They are Andrei Yusuf, the representative of Chief Intelligence Department, and Artem Shevchenko, journalist, serviceman, and author of the documentary series Military Intelligence of Ukraine. Good morning, gentlemen. Mr. Andri, the floor is yours. Please tell us about this operation. Good morning, dear friends, colleagues. Really, thank you. Thank you for your attention. The Special Operation of Chief Intelligence Department of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine was quite resonant both in Ukraine and in aggressor country, but abroad too. And it's quite reasonable. It's a very important and difficult operation because it has a principal meaning for the security and defense forces of Ukraine and it will have long-term consequences for the aggressor state, for their morale, as well as for their security and defense sector because this operation resulted in us obtaining very important information about aviation of the enemy and many other details that will be of help of us in defending our skies and destroying the enemy. Obviously, we have to th thank National Police of Ukraine in, for the, and the armed forces of Ukraine for the assistance in this operation. It's a many-month work which had no precedence in Ukraine before. We have examples in global history. We know the operations when different pilots, due to different reasons, brought their aircraft to the switching side. But now we're talking about the genocide war of Russia against Ukraine. And what has happened, we can tell you about it after the most recent presentations in particular the presentation of the documentary for example then the name Maxim Kuzminov captain the pilot of MI8 helicopter his decision was political ideological it was a decision of a person who condemns the genocide war of Russia against Ukraine who condemns the actions of Putin's regime and it all required very diligent work, assistance, support, and what's important, the pilot came up with this initiative first, and after a number of actions taken, this operation had taken place, and it was successful. We now can discuss the details. You have, have probably all seen the documentary, and we will talk about this trilogy. Also, there was an interview by, the, by a famous Ukrainian blogger, and we will have some communication later on. But we had results. A lot of Russian pilots are killed. Many more of them were taken prisoners of war. But that's yet a pivotal point. When people who condemn, condemn the war of Russia against Ukraine who bring the very pricey material to us and who choose the right side of history and it's just the beginning. I would like to give the floor to Artem Shevchenko, the author of trilogy Military Intelligence of Ukraine and author of this film, 
downed pilots. Artem, you are the author of the documentary, so what was behind the curtain? Good morning, we've made the third documentary dedicated to the successful fight of Ukraine against the enemy in the skies. We were able to take enemy out of the skies and we've shown this in the movie. This is a long, exhausting fight. Not everything was just as successful as now from the very beginning, but it was heroic from the beginning. So eventually we were able to take the enemy out of the skies and to inflict significant damage on the enemy. So we show eight downed pilots in this documentary, starting from a commander of aviation, uh, sorry, evacuation hel helicopter, and all the way until a number of the commanders of aviation regiments. Well, their fate is not heroic, they may or may not have chance to survive. In case of some pilots, their crew chiefs were killed after they were catapulted, and even if they stay alive, they were either killed or taken prisoners of war and then exchanged. The exchange is very important for us, for the Ministry of Defense, for the Chief Intelligence Department, and the head quarters, operational headquarters on prisoners of war, they do everything to exchange our guys for the Russian prisoners of war, so we, and the enemy pilots are a precious asset in this case, those, and it's a very important, very diligent work that is done by the headquarters on the prisoners of war. We show all the work in our documentary, so we finish it with quite a positive step. It's the chance for all the downed and not yet downed enemy pilots is to, s their right choice would be to switch sides, to take the risk, and using the working material, come to Ukraine, there are all opportunities to do so, which is clearly demonstrated by the pilot of this helicopter, a 28-year person, Maxim Kuzminov. And I would like to urge you, if in future we will continue to discuss this documentary, probably we won't be able to answer all of these questions. Please take it with understanding. It happens due to security reasons, maybe not all of the questions would be answered, but we will do everything we can to try to answer all of them. So now we would like to present a special guest, this special guest of this press conference, the pilot of the helicopter, Maxim Kuzminov, captain, the commander of the helicopter, tail number 62. Aviation Regiment 319, well, our guest only starts learning Ukrainian, but probably he does not understand everything, so he will be probably speaking with you in Russian. Also, I would like to understand that, I would like to ask you to understand that he, he may be a little bit worrying, so please take it with understanding again, and obviously, yeah, the, the working language is still Russian, probably he will switch to Ukrainian later, I hope. Well, yeah, bef hello, Maxim, before we begin, we understand there were, were may many events in this hall, in this studio, including talks with the Russian prisoners of war, but this man for us has taken the right choice, he's our friend, and today we're about to hear a very interesting story, which may become an interesting example for many people who still have strength to refuse to serve the criminal regime of Russian Federation. So please, Maxim, tell us about yourself, make some introduction, and then we will switch to questions and answers. Well, the first thing I would like to start with, you know, I'm quite excited, so please 
take my con current condition with understanding. I'm Kuzminov Maxim Hermanovich. I'm a helicopter pilot. It's a multi-purpose aircraft which fulfills tasks on transportation of uh, personnel and material as long as cargo. What can I tell you about myself? Since my early childhood, I was fond of flying. I would say starting from five years, my uh, uncle, or sorry, my grandfather, was the <laughs> pilot of Russian Federation Aviation. Maxim, we, we all welcome you in this studio. And the first question, obviously, will be, how have you come up with this decision? Well, well, when it all started on 24th, there was fear, there was suffering, there were tears. And the question was, why does my homeland needs this terrible war? So I went to the church, I put some candles, light up some candles in there, uh, only asking God to make it end the soon as possible. I was clearly understanding what was going on to me. I started studying. It was interesting to me to understand what has become the reason to start the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russian Federation. And I've understood it for myself that it's horror, it's crime, it's evil, and just like everybody probably understands any war, no matter how necessary it is, it's still a crime. And that there can be no questions about this. Thank you, Maxim. Dear colleagues, I'm sure you have questions, so please raise your hand and ask your questions well if you ask maxim please formulate your questions in russian for the sake of clear understanding dear questions friends microphone please introduce yourself dmitro Dedora, tv channel espresso i have questions to the representatives of the chief intelligence department i don't want to offend anyone but i understand there are certain precautions russia is still our enemy has the security service of ukraine and the chief intelligence department processed all the necessary checks to make sure th th that we that we can receive this gift from Russia. Well, obviously we did, you're not offending us, obviously, as we uh, start these kind of operations, when you'll know, like from the very beginning, Ukraine urges Russians to switch sides you, with their material, it's no propaganda, it's no lies. And now we see, we see with our own eyes how that project was implemented and all the complex of measures was taken to make sure that we're talking not about an enemy game, not about a counter game, but about our operation and real intentions of the pilot from that side. So yes, this situation and all the checks were in place. More questions? Kristina Velichanska, Fakti ICTV. The question is to the pilot. Can you please tell us as of the beginning of the full-scale invasion, where did you serve? What what orders were you supposed to fulfill? And what pushed you to get in touch with Central Intelligence Department? And what were your conditions? How were you communicating? Can, can you please give us some little bit more detail? Well, at least what you can. Well, I was sent, uh, serving in Chernihovka, Primorsky Krai, military base 13984. And as of the moment of the beginning of the full-scale invasion, I was in Amursky region. And we were building the Baikala Amursky main way. So I was on a duty trip. I was assigned to a different unit. So what served uh, a push? for me to the decision. That's 
full realization, full understanding of what was going on, I decided for myself that it was a crime, a cruel crime. I've decided for myself that I will not just take part in this thing. Yes, I have an aircraft left behind in Russia. I had two apartment blocks. I had good salary. A lot of things were holding me back, but they are of no importance to me. For me, what was important not to take part in this crime. I was subscribed to the public's of Chief Intelligence Department in Telegram. I was curious about what was going on and there were contacts under each post. So we, uh, I got in touch, we created a secret chat and we started communicating. Nobody in no case did not impose any opinion on me. It was my decision. I was not forced. I was not blamed. Again, I decided to do so and then like within the last half a year, we were building the routes. We were thinking how to make it more safe and secure. So, and then it has happened. So, Maxim, can you please tell us about this moment from the from that moment the helicopter was launched, and until you touched the ground in Ukraine, well, there was a special request. So, I did not hijack the helicopter. I brought it from point A to point B. There was a road established before, the landing point at 16.30, I've taken off from Kursk airfield to the end. I came to Kharkiv region, about 20 kilometers from the border. Then somewhere near Shebekina, I was flying on a very low altitude, 5 to 10 meters, keeping radio silence. Then as I was crossing the border, I started receiving fire. I don't know I, who was firing, but I suppose it was Russian side and I was injured. I got a leg injury with a small, ar small arms leg injury. Then, as I've just said, uh, I've flown 20 kilometers. I've landed in the established spot. I had two crew members on, on board. We had no arms on us. Our Crews, they fly without arms, so no one could resist me because the crew chief, he just didn't have a piloting skills. I was calming guys down, telling them, like, good people live here, everything's gonna be alright, but they still started being afraid and acting aggressive. So they have run outside the helicopter, I started running towards the border. I don't know about their fate, but what I've heard from the media, they were most likely to have been killed. Thank you, Maxim. Mr. Andre, the question will be to you. So uh, what is the fate of Maxim and for what is the fate of those who will take similar decision. Well, the law of Ukraine on the reward on the military material of aggressor state handed over to Ukraine. So this law is in place. Everybody can read it. There is a preamble. What is it for? The signature of President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, April 1st, 2022. The law is in effect, and based on that law, this operation was fulfilled. Again, I want to emphasize, Maxim is a free person in a free country, and he may tell you about his future by himself. As we know, he thinks about getting engaged in some work in security and defense sector of Ukraine to counter Russian aggression in the east of Ukraine, but it's his decision, a conscious decision of a person. Talking about the further steps, Ukraine demonstrates maximum transparency and democratic approach 
even regarding those who've undertaken the decision unconsciously, who are prisoners of war, but talking about those whose choice was con conscious, we have a unit made up of the citizens of Russian Federation who are against this war, against Russian aggression, against criminal actions of Putin's regime, against genocide, and today, together with the security and defense forces, they are counteracting Russian intentions. Part of them wants to change their citizenship to get Ukrainian passports. So now that we're talking about any actions are that are undertaken within the Ukrainian legislation, Ukraine fulfills their uh, our obligations, and about the future plans, we want to ask. We we can ask Maxim. Well, can you share our plans? Uh, yes, your plans about future. So I want to. Uh, I want to link my life to aviation. Uh, the offer was to stay here. Well, most likely I will say yes. So let's see how it happens. We have more questions from the floor, please. Thank you very much, Polina Litvinova, um, American Radio, National Public Radio. I have a question to Maxim. Maxim, can you please tell us before this operation, when you brought the helicopter to Ukrainian side, did, did you fulfill other tasks in the territory of Ukraine? And if so, where and what were those tasks? Yeah, with the tears in my eye, eyes, unwillingly, I was fulfilling the personnel or cargo only transfer tasks, no strikes. I was not inflicting any strikes. If I would have been tasked to do it, I wouldn't have done it anyway. So can you tell us a little bit more in detail about those operations? Where were they? Well, I was transporting the things and troops like from in the territory of Russia. Maybe I was transporting personnel, some spare parts, but sometimes I was forced to enter the territory of Ukraine with the same goals like trans transportation. Where have you been? In Ukraine, I've been to Mariupol, Berdansk, well, and that's it. Dear friends, do we have any more questions on the floor? Taras Levchenko, Radio Svoboda. Mr. Andriy, I have a question to you. You emphasize that Maxim had ideological reasons to switch sides, but there is a reward, and we know from different sources, both American and European, that Russia continues working with the agents. They invest millions or tens of millions of dollars. So don't you think that Maxim can be bought again, maybe if he's paid more, he, he may become an agent of Russian Federation in the Ukrainian Armed Forces or Air Force, should he join them? Well, thank you for your question. The question whether we think or speculate, you know, the risks like that are always being considered, so before we proceed to the final stage of the operation, again, I want to reiterate it, We've discussed it before, all the direct and cross measures w were in place to fulfill all the checks. Then in this situation, we're talking about pilots, after all, and Maxim and pilots in the territory of Russian state, they are not poor people. And if we analyze all the payments they get and other be benefits, what they lose and what they gain, you know, the risk factor, well, you can always ask what is the amount of reward that could make you risk your life and the life of your loved ones. And in this case, this person has risked. It's not a walk, it's a special operation. There were risks on both sides and all of them were considered and it doesn't mean that we should lose vigilance obviously obviously the aggressor state continues investing colossal resources in reinforcing their influence to recruit new agents to continue implementing new intelligence and counterintelligence games but it doesn't mean that ukraine 
has to play def in defense only. We also grow grow the agent network in the aggressor state, not only in not only of high number but of high quality too and we're not going to disclose obviously the details of any further operations but what's important to us is that Ukraine plays fair if we have a law in place which says that such a reward should be paid so such reward will be paid and if this law contemplates all the pro protection measures for persons who switch sides it means that all of those things will be in place here but what i want to emphasize that, that the motive is not of a financial nature because there's a lot of risks involved a lot of difficult decisions and implementation of this operation is not like we were preparing within half a year and then like here we go we've made we've made it there were a lot of other risks in in russian federation and today we can only continue talking because those risks were mitigated by a diligent work and the factor of loved ones of loved ones of the pilot in ukraine it's more than eloquent in my opinion thank you dear friends do we have any more questions Ukrainska Pravda, Sonia Lukashova, I have a question to the representatives of the Central Intelligence Department. Can you please uh, give us more details? Who got in touch with the pilot, the representative of which agency, and when, when did he contact Central Intelligence Department? And the question to the pilot, can you please tell us about the guarantees you were promised, and do you know how the Russian government reacted. Is there any reaction from your command, any inspections in your military unit? Well, I will start. We got this information in the intelligence from the National Police of Ukraine. The representatives of Central Intelligence Department got involved in this work. Very diligent, meticulous, difficult work. The establishment of communication, check of reliability, and check of the security of those communication channels. It was all done in compliance with the highest standards that can exist in the operation of the special services like that. I cannot tell you directly, obviously, who was it. They were the operatives of the Central Intelligence Department. It was quite a high-class, high-quality job done by them. And the second part, well, uh, obviously, we cannot disclose their positions and their personal details, but it's good that we have such people there. And the work brings good results. So what was the second question? Well, the second question was to Maxim, how was this information perceived in his military unit? Maybe some checks. What have you been promised here? Well, first of all, it was a security for me and my family. Payments, new documents, the, the, those are the main things. Is your family with you? Yes, my parents are with me. And do you know anything about what's going on in your military unit? How those news were perceived? Maybe some checks are going on. I think a lot of checks and inspections are going on there. We have more questions from the floor. I would like to ask the representatives of the Central Intelligence Department for more details. I understand that you were in touch for six months. Maybe some attempts failed. Something just didn't work. So that stage when you've already come up to the very final stage of evacuation of pilot, what was going on then what, what's with the helicopter is that helicopter used now and then we will have more questions to the pilot well look due to the nature of this special operation we cannot disclose all the details like with all due respect but obviously the work was long it didn't happen like right away it didn't happen with the first attempt
we were trying for, to do it, but some factors worked that made us postpone or suspend the operation, and it's good we were able to come to this point on the 9th of August. I cannot disclose all the standards the law prohibits to do so, but it's a high quality work worth of the highest standards of the special services I compared with the Operation Diamond completed by the Mossad Israeli intelligence in 1966. Back then they have convinced the Iraqi pilot to bring the MiG-21, then most modern Russian fighter jet that were supplied to Iraq, they were also brought to Syria and Egypt, they were preparing for the war and Mossad was understanding that the Arabic countries were preparing the invasion, otherwise why would they get so much material from Russia, from Soviet Union, and that operation after very long work which was brilliant uh, it, it just didn't happen in a blink of an eye one Syrian pilot was killed but eventually operation was successful Israelis got the MiG-21 fixed wing aircraft and thanks to that they got the advantage in the skies during the so-called six days war all the Russian aviation, all the Soviet aviation was destroyed by Israeli Mirage fighters and basically Israel won this six days war in six days well it clearly talks about the standards of the special services and I think that our special services I mean the Central Intelligence Department has have already achieved that level and I think that will that event will enter the history well we will be able to disclose more details after some time but some stages some phases when we were trying to provide security for the family of the pilot to process different scenarios it's yet another big part of this work we processed a number of scenarios and when it was happening it, it was a complex work of the security and defense forces yes it's the operation of central intelligence department and after the victory we will be able to call his maybe not name but at least a call sign but we cannot do it right now but we understand the materials of this press conference will not be seen by the good people only but also but by FSB and general headquarters of Russian Federation so we cannot give them any information that would facilitate the disclosure of future operations our task is to show it to the whole world, to show the whole world that there is a choice not to become a, a, a war criminal, you're not slaves, so please switch sides, come to Ukraine, who guarantees security, who complies with its obligations, and this way you can do better even for your homeland, for your loved ones, and for the future of your kids. Those are the main messages that we, together with the participants with, of this press conference, we try to communicate to the world. Well, what about the helicopter? The helicopter is a part of aviation unit of Chief Intelligence Department, together with other aircraft, at the end, it will be used as purposed. One probably of the most difficult phases of this operation was to quickly organize secure corridor in that specific spot because everything was happening quite quick. There was no time to organize and agree all the issues, but it was eventually done the corridor was secured many components of the security and defense forces were engaged in this operation so we had to make sure this helicopter is not downed on the way 
But again, as Maxim said, he was receiving fire as he was flying, but the helicopter is in good condition. It was manufactured in 2016. I want to tell you, we don't have helicopters as new as that. All the helicopters, I, I mean the, the models of this MI-8 line, we, we have Western specimens, more modern, but this this machine is very modern, it's very good, it works quite well, well, and it will reinforce the capabilities of the aviation of Chief Intelligence Department of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. Your question, please. TV channel Ukraina, I have a question to Maxim. I'll switch to occupiers language. Maxim, you were saying that you were against all the old orders that you were getting from the beginning of the full-scale invasion, but you were fulfilling them, and it was like for how long? Since the very beginning. So still, it's important for us to understand what has become a breaking point for you. Maybe the death of some pilots that you knew before. What has become the pivotal point? Why have you decided to cooperate? Well, uh, yeah, I got you. Uh, well, first and foremost, first of all, it's a great country with a very good people living here. I didn't want to be of assistance in any of those cries. You know, I, I like Skolka, Kalosh, they have this beautiful son, Batkushin, well, the classic guys. I was listening to their music in Russia, uh, and people kept coming to me asking, like, why do you listen to them? Well, I told them, I like, I liked it, I like it. And, you know, I was getting a bad attitude. I was trying to promote my position. Maybe they were trying to demonstrate it, like they were from inside of them, they were feeling like, why, why? Well, have you have I answered your question? Every day, every day I was in touch and everything was all, all right. So, so your parents, have they agreed? Yes, yeah, they were supporting me completely. Well, the parents were clearly understanding what was going on too. Well, we have more questions. New place, I had a similar question about the parents. I wanted to find out a little bit more in detail, if it's possible, when you have taken the decision to switch sides, how have you communicated it to the parents? How have you discussed it, given the, the, that fact that your grandfather is a pilot, is a decorated pilot in Russian Federation. Well, I've taken the decision in December 2022, and this is when it all started, the countdown has started. Talking about my grandfather, he tragically passed in 2013 in, in the sky, so to say, in the age of 72 years. He was quite a vivid person. He has a lot of uh, hours of experience in 19 types of aircraft so I followed his steps so to say Maxim question about the sentiment in your military unit what they what it was and maybe you have something to say to those who are still fulfilling the orders there well, I think that many people just don't understand what's going on. They don't think with their heads. Like somewhere up there, they are not quite friendly with their heads, but... What do you want to say? I li I've liked our country, Ukraine. It's inhabited by kind people. It has a lot of beautiful places. I obviously would like the guys to follow me, to fly over here, to see that there are no Nazis, no fascists living here, as they are told in propaganda news. I would like, obviously, them to see everything with their own eyes. 
well dear friends do we have any more questions let's take two more questions and wrap up good morning nikita galka public tv of ukraine i have a question to the pilot i would like to ask do you know about any cases when the representatives of the ministry of defense of R russia or any people like those were trying to get in touch with you or your family after you've taken the helicopter to ukraine and the second question is to the representatives of intelligence the enemy helicopter according to the previous information it was transporting some parts for the aircraft so what were those parts for which type of fixed wing aircraft and the again enemy helicopter from the point of view of technologies and communication is of great value to ukraine were those elements used to better understand what's going on inside the enemy country in that specific unit what are the plans of that specific unit of russian federation thank you i think that people were trying to contact me but i was not responding i was not getting in touch with anybody in no way yeah the helicopter tail number 62 amtsh it was transporting a valuable cargo the aviation equipment of different types with no details it was for fighter jets su-30 sm and su-35 i think so respectively it significantly has influenced the capability battle capabilities of those aircraft to, to which those components were going and you are right the technological equipment that is installed on the rotary wing aircraft let us better understand the enemy aviation security and communication systems and it significantly influenced it has significantly influenced already and it will continue influencing the result of counteraction the enemy threats from the skies after this as you may remember there were a number of successful operations maybe it's all connected but maybe not but the fact that it's a valuable information and that it's used it's used for its purpose it's the fact well we had another question do we have any other questions left please can you please tell us you're showing your face you could, could have your face covered like aren't you afraid for your life well you know it's a war going on and wouldn't you like for example to go abroad of ukraine somewhere to europe do you have any motives to do so or do you want to stay here so tell us a little bit more about your plans again your parents they left everything behind they've come here so are, aren't they afraid to stay here aren't they afraid of russian agents here well i'm uh, very believing person i trust in god and i started my day with the worst universe is my way but but you, you know the fear humiliates you know i am not afraid to anything if god gave me this life the god will take it away I, i'm a, a, of course i'm a, a excited well talking about uh leaving for europe you know th there are such opportunities many ways are open to me but we'll see we'll see how it happens well andre well talking about the face we have to understand that ukrainians have not seen maxim's face but for fsb it's no secret they have seen his face and again it's the matter of principle it's the decision of the pilot to be public because this story is public it's open and in this situation it's a matter of principle of ukraine and of the pilot and we understand as long as putin's regime exists there are threats for both pilots and millions of ukrainians as long as, as well as millions of 
citizens of Russian Federation as long as this war is going on. So the task of all the people in the free world is the victory of Ukraine and our task and the task of all the security and defense forces is to make sure it happens the soonest possible. Then there will be safety and security for all. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for being with us today. I want to thank all of our speakers and I hope it will be not only Maxim who will use these opportunities provided by our country. I want to thank you. I want to thank our armed forces. Let's continue working for our victory. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes.